The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sherry Lichtenberg with NRRI. Welcome to our June 13 webinar, Tracking Net Neutrality, Pathways to an Open Internet. Today is, three, is day three of the Restoring Internet Freedom order going into effect, so it has become a really good day to talk about net neutrality. What is it? How are the states handling it? And where do we go from here? We have over 100 participants today, and they come both from the states and from some state governor's office, from Nasuka, and from industry. Let me start by introducing our panelists, the Honorable Travis Kavula, the Vice Chairman of the Montana Public Service Commission, Jonathan Banks, Senior Vice President, Law and Policy for U.S. Telecom, Rick Zimmerman, Vice President, External and State Affairs for NCTA, and Normal Gadfly. Tim Carr, Senior Director of Strategy and Communications for Free Press. And last but certainly not least, Ellen Swanson Katz, who is the President of, Na of NASUCA and the Consumer Council for the State of Connecticut. And with me here at the NRRI offices is Katherine Klein, our senior research associate, who is the guru behind the net neutrality tracker, which I'm sure all of you have seen. We will be looking forward to hearing your questions, and so you will type those in the question box and we will try to answer them. We're going to start by with a short presentation about how we put the net neutrality tracker together and a level setting on where we are and where we've been with net neutrality. So given that, let me turn the program over to Katherine Klein. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, I appreciate those kind words. So before we dive into our discussion, like Sherry said, I'm going to be providing a little bit of level setting uh, net neutrality as an issue. So first of all, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the history. Um, so in 2004, uh, we've had a very colorful history over the past uh, about 15 years. Uh, but in 2004, the FCC first talked about this concept of net neutrality. So the chair at the time, Michael Powell, outlined four internet freedoms in a speech. And these freedoms include the freedom to access lawful content, the freedom to run applications and services, the freedom to connect uh, for their choice of legal devices that do not harm the network, and the freedom to have competition among networks. In 2005, the FCC gave uh, Chairman Powell four internet freedoms some legal force. This is the first time that the FCC had fined um, a telecom provider, and this was a DSL provider named Madison River, who was at the time blocking Vonage. So the FCC ordered the company to stop blocking, and this action transformed these basic concepts into a legally binding regime. In 2010, the FCC issued its first open internet order using Title I authority, which gave the FCC auxiliary legal authorities under the Telecommunications Act. Carriers challenged this premise in several court cases, and courts determined that the FCC lacked sufficient authority to enforce net neutrality rules under its Title I authority. So then in 2015, the FCC chair at the time, Tom Wheeler, sort of took another crack at net neutrality. With the 2015 Open Internet Order, these rules cited the FCC's broader authority, this time under Title II of the Telecommunications Act. Title II gives the Commission the power to regulate anyone who offers telecommunications services for fee. On such services, the FCC is empowered to ban both unjust 
and unreasonable discrimination. In 2016, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the FCC's open internet order. Um, and then most recently, in 2017, uh, current chair Ajit Pai issued the Restoring Internet Freedoms Order. And this reversed the 2015 Open Internet Order and provides uh, what's been referred to as more of a light touch regulatory schema. Uh, in February of 2018, the um, New York Attorney General coordinated with 21 states and DC to petition for a review of S the FCC's Restoring Internet Freedom Order. And that is currently underway. At the same time, uh, state legislators have begun to consider a series of resolutions and bills that would protect the original net neutrality principles. So we're going to really focus on that today. So the FCC uh, in the 2015 Open Internet Order established three rules. Very simply, it's the no blocking, no throttling, and no paid prioritization. So what NRI has been working on is developing what we're calling a state action tracker for net neutrality rules. We've been tracking rules since 2018 and we're looking at uh, state legislation or proposed legislation, state executive orders, state resolutions, uh, and the ongoing appeal to the 2017 order. In addition, we've also been able to document net neutrality cities, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And we've been looking at the impact of these different net neutrality bills or executive orders on state utility commissions and providing relevant dockets. We've been tracking all of this using uh, LegisScan uh, news and reports from states individually. So states have responded in, in a series of different ways. Six states have provided executive orders. And uh, generally speaking, there's some variation between states with all the executive orders and laws and resolutions. But they establish standards for contracting with state entities who are providing internet. Uh, and they require that state contractors not, do not block, throttle, or engage in paid prioritization. There have been several different strategies in the bills that we've seen proposed. Um, some of them reestablished the 2015 FCC rules against blocking and throttling. Others require that ISPs certify compliance with consumer protection and net neutrality standards. Some require that ISPs uh, publicly disclose accurate information regarding their network management practices. And some establish standards for state entities contracting with ISPs, much like the executive orders we've seen. Uh, in terms of resolutions, the resolutions we've seen coming out of state bodies have generally urged the FCC to reinstate 2015 open internet uh, order, and we've also seen them urge U.S. Congress to intervene to protect net neutrality rules and clarify principles and statutes. Uh, the legal challenge that we've seen, the big one, is uh, this New York Attorney General challenge that has included several different uh, states, um, and this uh, argues that under the Administrative Procedure Act, the FCC can't make arbitrary and capricious changes to existing policies. And it also says that this new order misinterprets critical record evidence. So this is just a map of some of the, the resolutions and tracking that we've done. As you can see, most many states have engaged in uh, some form of action surrounding net neutrality, uh, and more than half of states have. This is actually a more thorough breakdown of tables. You can see that we have um, executive orders listed, the bills and resolutions. So there have been six executive orders. We've seen three bills that have already been passed. Um, we have one resolution that's been passed in California. As you can see, there are also a number of states that still have pending bills um, and pending resolutions. And then we also have, as, this, um, as many states um, legislature their year it comes to an end we've had a lot of uh, bills or attempts that haven't passed and so those are documented here as well for more detailed information on different state actions please do check out our website on at nri.com or sorry nri.org good catch sherry uh, we also have a map here of states that have that are petitioning for this review of the fcc's restoring internet freedom order as you can see, that's the number of states. Many of the states have already been active in this area with bills or executive orders. 
And then finally, I just wanted to mention that there is also activity going on at a much more localized level. And so um, the Free Press has created a city's open internet pledge that provides six different standards that uh, mayors can agree to follow when looking at internet procurement for their cities. It focuses on making sure that cities are procuring internet services from companies that don't block throttle or provide paid prioritization, ensuring an open internet connection with any free or subsidized service, not blocking, throttling, or engaging in paid prioritization when providing internet services directly to residents, uh, requiring clear and accessible notices of filtering, blocking, and prioritization policies to the extent permitted, monitoring the practices of internet service providers, and encouraging consumers to use ISPs that abide by open internet policies. So this is a list of the cities, and I know that we've gone through a lot of information very quickly, and so if you're interested in taking a more detailed look at our slides, feel free to find them. Again, it's on the NRI.org website. And with that, I'm going to pass this along to Sherry. So thank you, Catherine. I think there has been a lot going on, and, and you've summarized it very well. Let me just uh, tell the everyone who is listening to us that if you have a question, you will find the question box on the right-hand side. Uh, you can blow it up and you can type in your question. And um, if you can't figure out how to do that, you can email me your question and we'll go forward with it. So without further ado, let's go around the room and hear how you, how each of our panelists defines net neutrality and put this into some context with, for us. So let me start, Ellen Katz, if you would be so kind as to go first. Yes, and thank you, Sherry. Thank you for the opportunity. Net neutrality to me is basically the status quo of which we were assured of until Monday that when we log into the internet, we go where to whatever website we want, we look at whatever lawful content we want without any intentional slowing down, speeding up, or blocking. And I think it's a fundamental policy decision that we're talking about now, whether the internet should be free, unfettered, uncensored, and equally accessible to all, and certainly the vast majority of Americans say, yes, it should be. And certainly, without net neutrality, internet service providers are now free to manage your experience on the web by making it easier to go here and harder to go there. And as a consumer advocate, I certainly think it's essential that we keep the internet free, clear, and equally accessible to all. And that's been Nasuka's position because the internet is the essential communication tool of the 21st century. And we want everyone to have equal access both to content and to the ability to share their own ideas and speech. So, Thank you, Ellen. And so in the interest of fair and balanced discussion, Rick, you can go next. Sure, but happy to. You need to. to unmute your phone to do that. No, I've just done that. So, yes, Sherry, thank you to you or, uh, and the organizers uh, for having me on today. So, I don't really disagree with anything Ellen said, except for one thing, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, I will describe um, the, a, defi a definition differently, but just for, you know, contextualization, should point out that, um, you know, I, I guess I'm the, the old man on the dais here. I've been working on this issue since 1998 uh, when it was referred to as open access, uh, which is an important part of the history. We're not going to get into all of it today, but led to the prior decision under which cable modem service was uh, classified as an information service and then ultimately DSL service was also classified as an information service. Uh, but the definitions have changed over the years. Open access in its original incarnation had to do with physical access to cable networks. But then after the Four Freedoms, um, it has uh, morphed since that time, um, starting in, 
you know, say the 2010 timeframe with the Chairman Janikowski's order, uh, all of a sudden paid prioritization became a big deal, which had not really been, uh, I don't know if it wasn't conceived of or wasn't a big deal before. Um, and now I think the generally accepted definition, if I, I hesitate to use the term, but I'll say it is, you know, no blocking, no throttling, no unreasonable discrimination. And there's a question about pay prioritization, uh, you know, no unreasonable pay prioritization, no pay prioritization at all. Uh, folks can differ on that. But where I differ with Ellen is she mentioned the status quo. And I just want to be clear that uh, the status quo, perhaps that she is referring to, is the status quo that only existed for two years. Because prior to the 2015 order, uh, when net neutrality, um, it, it, there were little to no sort of violations of what is generally conceived of as net neutrality, uh, that was uh, the law of the land. Everything was fine before 2014. Um, you know, you had four different presidents uh, or, or four different commissions under four different presidents with four different uh, ways of articulating what they thought should be. You know, only the um, the most recent, uh, the the Wheeler um, Commission, uh, came up with a Title II classification. Um, so I think status quo uh, prior to 2015 is what we think the right status quo should be. And we can quibble about whether that's where we are or not, and I'm sure we'll do that shortly. We will be quibbling a lot soon, I'm sure. So, Tim, what... How would you frame this question of net neutrality? Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for having me on the work that you're doing to track um, all of this local net neutrality. Activism in state houses and town and city halls is, is really important and really indicative of, of where we're going. And, and uh, I, I will get to my uh, definition in about 10 seconds, but first I, I would say that we have not returned to the status quo prior to 2015. There has been, there have been net neutrality protections in place in one form or the other. The earlier versions did fail a court review um, for much of the history of the internet. Now, net neutrality is for me, and I think for most people who are very passionate about this issue, it is the rule that gives internet users ultimate control over their media experience. And what I mean by that is that it's a rule that prevents their internet access provider from blocking, throttling, or discriminating uh, with their connections. And, and that's really important for a lot of reasons because the internet has come to mean so much more than uh, just a one-way communications medium, like the mediums most people are familiar with who lived prior to you know 1995 and and uh, the net neutrality keeps the internet open in a way uh, that's very important and it rests on a solid legal foundation uh, the legal foundation that withstood that court review in 2016 that says that internet access providers in order in order to prevent internet access providers from blocking or, or throttling or slowing down your connections they have to behave under Title II of the Telecommunications Act, which is to say they have to behave like common carriers and that they carry all content equally without blocking or throttling in ways that are unreasonable, um, that would prevent internet users from going to the websites and services that they prefer to use. So John, what is your view here? Uh, my view is sort of like with Rick and Ellen, and thank you for having us and U.S. Telecom on this, but I think our perspective is that um, net neutrality is sort of a consumer-driven thing, and it has to do with consumers thinking that when they buy an Internet access service, that they think that that service will let them traverse the Internet and take advantage of all the information and services and content on the Internet. And let me point out that to meet that consumer expectation means that um, the companies I represent, or Rick and, and lots of others, have to invest constantly in upgrading facilities and building fiber and buying and installing better electronics to the tune of $75 billion a year 
to keep the internet improving all the time. So, Travis, you come from Montana, and Montana has an executive order about contracting. Can we talk about what, what you're seeing already? Yeah, well, let's do just that, Sherry. And if you advance to the uh, next slide, uh, I'll give my usual caveats and disclaimers, which is that I don't represent the state of Montana, its governor, or its Department of Administration, and indeed, quite the contrary. Uh, the governor's administration and I disagree on the state's action in regard to executive orders. Um, I'm an elected commissioner in Montana, so I, I really don't owe anything to the governor uh, or the rest of the executive administration. But I am going to try to provide a uh, quote-unquote neutral overview of the state of Montana's recent actions on net neutrality by quoting from primary source documents uh, as well as uh, um, uh, some of the consequences that we've seen thus far. So if you go to the next slide, um, th this is the context in which I'm talking about. Uh, as you heard earlier from Catherine in December, uh, the FCC published its order effective just a few days ago that rolled back um, the, uh, the open internet order that the previous uh, FCC administration had passed. And on the heels of that, uh, Montana's Governor Steve Bullock uh, issued an, an executive order in January 22nd, later amended in March, that provides for uh, some internet neutrality principles in the context of state procurement. So uh, a number of, uh, of other states have acted in this regard, uh, at least with respect to Montana, the tender hook is state procurement. Not a, not a purported attempt to have a regulatory agency like mine enforce net neutrality um, on, uh, on, on uh, communications within the state. Um, I think it's tacitly accepted in the context of the uh, executive order uh, that these are services traditionally regulated on an interstate basis by the FCC. Uh, however, nothing prevents the state, this is the logic, uh, from essentially uh, bending these providers to the state's will in the context of the state's payment for and receipt of services uh, from, for example, data transport providers. So this executive order has first been implemented in the context of uh, the, our state's data transport, RFP. Uh, it was issued in order to replace an expiring 10-year-long set of contracts and it called for a three-year-long set of contracts with extensions possible. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. But next slide, please. If we just look at the, uh, uh, the wording of the executive order, um, these are the practices which, in the context of state procurement, uh, it purports to prohibit. So number one, no blocking. Number two, no throttling. Number three, no paid prioritization. And then number four, uh, a kind of ambiguous word salad about unreasonably interfering with or unreasonably disadvantaging end users' ability to access uh, apps, content, services, devices. Uh, devices is an interesting thing to throw in there, uh, as well as edge providers' ability to make lawful content apps, services, devices available to end users. So on its face, it, it could be said to be even broader uh, than net neutrality itself, although so this fourth provision remains largely untested. Uh, go to the next slide, please. It also has a positive requirement, as you can see here, for uh, uh, transparency in network and transport management practices, as well as band internet service offerings. Uh, and then in order to fill in the details of this executive order that was issued in January, um, it has a delegation to the Department of Administration, which was supposed to adopt policies by March 1st uh, to, uh, to implement all of this. Uh, so let's talk about the agency. Next slide, please. That's responsible for implementing some of this. Uh, our Department of Administration functions as our state's procurement agency, and for central services such as data transport, uh, DOA runs procurements, and for other agencies like mine, DOA uh, oversees compliance with state procurement law and practices. Uh, really what this executive order does or purports to do is to make DOA the uh, de facto net neutrality regulator um, of any business that provides uh, services, broadband services that are subject to it. Um, and, uh, and in its contractual agreements uh, 
uh, that it negotiates on behalf of the state with these providers. Um, it, it will it, it is inserted contract language, which you'll see in just a moment, uh, that essentially gives it the power uh, to resolve and mediate and define some of these uh, disputed terms. It did release in the context of its data transport RFP some guidance to offerers, um, but there hasn't been any uh, administrative rulemaking uh, or agency orders on implementation. It's just been essentially uh, procurement policies that have been announced. Um, I mentioned data R, uh, the data transport RFP. Uh, so far, it, it doesn't seem that other services such as cellular data have been affected. Uh, you know, obviously I have a state uh, cell phone, um, I use data on it, um, and uh, but those those extant contracts and the new ones uh, as they're renewed so far seem unaffected, um, although it's, it's not a large leap to think that they might be ultimately. So let's get into the next slide, please. Um, let's get into some of the dilemma about how the nature of this term net neutrality and how it's defined. And I'll, I'll dwell on this slide for just a minute longer than the previous ones, because the first text box that you see there was part of the data transport RFP. In other words, it's, it's a question uh, uh, or a direction to offerers that the State Department of Administration inserted in the RFP and asked bidders or offerers how they would fulfill this provision. And so here it's titled prioritization of transport services. Offers were asked to include a detailed explanation of how your company will prioritize the state's traffic in relation to other customers who may also be affected by the same disaster. If you read the whole document, uh, this exists in the context of network disruptions uh, in case of emergencies or network-wide outages uh, where data uh, transport services have to be uh, stood back up. And so the, the RFP the state of Montana issued, and granted the RFP was issued before the executive order, is asking bidders to essentially sell pay pri paid prioritization to the state for their the, the quick recovery uh, of, of the state's data. Um, and then you can compare that uh, to the prohibition in the executive order on paid prioritization. And so what's in a name uh, is the prohibition on paid prioritization effectively preclude what the state itself was there to for asking for. Uh, it's sort of unclear uh, that that issue hasn't quite been resolved exactly. Next slide, please. So a little more discussion on data transport. Um, as I said, it was issued, uh, it, the RFP was pending when the executive order issued. Um, in late March, a subsequent executive order with much of the same language moved forward the applicability date, which you earlier saw as July 1st to April 1st, uh, such that uh, this RFP would be effective, affected by uh, the net neutrality mandate. Um, one bidder did withdraw after this change was made, uh, and they did so by not making a best and final offer as they were anticipated to do in the RFP. However, all the other bidders, uh, five in total, were selected in the context of the RFP award. Two bidders have already agreed to contract language, which you'll see in, the moment, in a moment, and three are still in negotiation. Um, I'm not going to, with respect, identify these people uh, for you, these entities for you, uh, because they are still in these commercially sensitive negotiations with the state of Montana. But I, I can say that they represent a pretty broad swath of the industry and business model types. Uh, so next slide, let's jump into just a few of the contract provisions. And I'm definitely not going to try to read uh, all of these to you. This slide deck will be available online at nri.org. Um, but these are the provisions that were written into the contract, which again, a couple providers have already agreed to, and three people, if they want a contract, must agree to. There's, as I understand it, there, there really isn't any room at this point to negotiate around this language, and they've, they've, and they've certified that, uh, that through their bids, uh, their best and final offer, that they've agreed to these provisions. Um, first, that the contractor shall comply with the executive order, uh, second, I'll just highlight the, under reasonable network management uh, that there is a carve out uh, for people to, uh, who, uh, um, who have quote unquote legitimate network management purposes um, to, uh, to slow down, speed up, throttle, I, I assume certain 
uh, data online. Uh, and then finally, with respect to the data transparency provisions or mandate that was in the executive order, um, the state of Montana, through its contract language, essentially did decide to defer uh, to the FCC's transparency rule on that. Next slide, please. The provision of services, um, so uh, the contractor shall not, with respect to any customer in the state of Montana, including but not limited to the state itself, do the, the four things that I had previously read off. I, I again highlight uh, the fourth because in, in some respects it's the most uh, ambiguous and uh, unusual. Uh, and then there's also a compliance provision, um, and I've been calling this the books and records provision because it's a sort of classic uh, Public Utility Commission style of regulation um, that, that allows uh, the regulator or the counterparty, in this case the Department of Administration, uh, to obtain uh, books and records to demonstrate compliance with these net neutrality provisions. Next slide, please. There's a provision which I won't get into that uh, governs disputes over the meaning of these sometimes ambiguous terms. Uh, it calls for good faith negotiations and escalation to senior management within 30 days if it can't be resolved, and then another 30 days to pursue remedies within the contract uh, if they're unable to, if the counterparties are unable to resolve uh, that dispute. Next slide. This is my final provision on, uh, or text slide on contract provisions, and this basically just gives um, the, uh, the offerers and the state of Montana an out. Um, I, don't think, I don't think the state is trying to uh, bind uh, these providers uh, even in the event that the executive order is overturned or preempted. Uh, the state is not saying that well, whatever may be said about federal preemption, the fact is you agreed to a contract with this stuff in it. Uh, in reality, uh, because of this changes in law provision, if the executive order is preempted, uh, either conflict preemption or field preemption um, in a court challenge, uh, then all of what you've seen previously that have been written into the contracts will be void. So let's, next slide please, get into some of the uh, reasons for the state action. Um, and uh, I've, ta I've taken a little liberty, which probably suggests that I might, I might disagree with the executive order a little bit, uh, to describe these as the official reasons uh, that appear in the executive order. Uh, the executive order cites procurement of goods and services as a reason. Uh, it says that it's an essential response for state procurement policy. Uh, it talks about the fact that uh, the state of Montana has a distributed data storage model uh, and thousands of employees across the state and paid prioritization and throttling could impact those state ability, employees' ability to conduct their business. And then finally, it, it observes that many government services in the state are exclusively online and throttling and paid prioritization could limit uh, my state citizens from uh, the ability to receive those services, deepening the digital divide. There are, of course, some other reasons for state action as well. Next slide. And that's because net neutrality is widely politically popular. Um, I don't think it, it may be a surprise to some of you, but certainly not to people within the state that uh, Governor Bullock is term limited and he's raising money for future political campaigns. He's seeking to raise his po political profile and a lot of that fundraising does occur in Silicon Valley. Uh, net neutrality is a great wedge issue in the state. Uh, I'm under no illusion that my own point of view on it is probably deeply unpopular uh, if you were to subject it to poll testing in the state of Montana. And uh, Democrats uh, tend to be less politically powerful in Montana, but run successfully when they, they identify uh, certain issues that can attract uh, public popularity uh, and where the Republicans uh, are less popular on those issues. Uh, and then finally, I, I think it's just the nature of government that executive orders are splashy when they're first announced, um, but they're kind of cost-free in terms of drawing little scrutiny in their implementation, cost-free in a political sense. So I've included a picture here of uh, the day that the executive order was announced. This is Governor Bullock taking a selfie with uh, a uh, class at Helena High School. Um, and that's, that's I, I guess I haven't done a selfie in the context of my advocacy around this issue, but maybe it's overdue. Uh, final slide, um, some criticisms of this policy, um, and, and this probably is just, I'll just attribute all these to myself. First, and, and probably most importantly, I, I feel that state procurement should not be preconditioned on restraining corporate behavior that is unpopular, but nevertheless lawful. 
Uh, I mean, we're a, we're a nation of laws. The state of Montana is a state of laws. And I, I can imagine that the legal framework that the governor has laid here uh, will probably be used in the future by, say, you know, a future Republican governor that seeks to condition or intermediate healthcare providers doing business with the state uh, by preconditioning their provision of, say, abortion services. Um, you, can, you can imagine any number of other circumstances where behavior that's defined as lawful uh, is nonetheless subject to uh, the governor's whims uh, in terms of the provision of services for the purpose of doing business with the state. I, I just happen to think that's, that's not good policy and opens us up to uh, an abuse of power situation. Second, and on a more sort of uh, telecom focused note or calm policy note, um, I really doubt the technical capacity of our state government to meaningfully administer these contract definitions or to find the terms that are in dispute. Um, I, I don't, uh, in my brief discussions with Department of Administration, um, they certainly aren't hiring any new people. Um, they have just a handful of overworked people who already have quite a bit to do and not a clear view on, on how these contracts might be enforceable uh, in case uh, uh, net these net neutrality provisions were violated. Um, third, I I'm at least a little bit concerned uh, about um, a possible diminution of offerings for telecommunication services to the state. Uh, you know, we didn't see that broadly speaking in the data transport RFP. I, I did note that one bidder did drop out. Um, I think if this policy were applied to um, uh, cellular data, uh, you might see a different response, uh, and that has me a little bit uh, concerned. Um, and then finally, uh, something anticipated by the state's data transport RFP itself, shouldn't the state want paid prioritization of data with respect to these essential governmental services? You know, the state, the state of Montana as a customer has long insisted that its data be brought back online earlier than others in the context of its contracting practices because the state has reasoned that its data is more important as a matter of public policy than data associated with YouTube chat videos. Uh, call that view what you will, um, but that's been built into contracts before. Uh, it, it continues in some weird way to be uh, a matter of sort of dispute and subject to uh, what I would imagine will be quite a bit of legal wrangling uh, as this contract administration unfolds in the future. Um, so that's it for me. My apologies for interrupting the flow of thought with the slide deck, um, but I hope you'll find some of the language I've cited reasonable. And you can always reach me next slide at my email address or telephone number. Um, your, your data will not be slowed down if you try to email me um, at the address below. Sherry, back to you. Actually, Commissioner Kabula would prefer you to send him a fax. <laughs> I do take faxes, it's true. So I, that was a really good overview of, of what a state is doing. And so, um, Ellen, if we could turn to you for a moment, sure. why is it that we are seeing so much happening in the states in regards to net neutrality? Why are the states leading this fight? Well, I think there's several reasons. I think as uh, Commissioner Kavula told you, um, it's, a, it's an issue, as he noted, it's a real issue of consumer concerns, uh, overwhelming number of citizens support net neutrality, and I think that state legislators and, and governors are understandably concerned about losing what we sort of were agreeing was the status quo, this idea that the internet is this thing that is open and equally accessible to all. And so um, I think the short answer is because the FCC has stepped back and has not uh, provided an adequate substitute with the FTC in many people's minds. Um, and I think that's why people are playing it, are so many state houses are, are weighing into this issue. Um, and I think, you know, you can also take the cynical view um, or sort of a more political view that this is, um, you know, sort of a, has a populist appeal and, and it's pitting an un, unpopular big telecom companies against 
Joe Citizen. Um, I certainly think that in popular culture, uh, as has been publicized by various late night um, commentators and comedians, uh, it really it really is a is this almost a generational issue in in many ways. Um, but I certainly hope that in the end, legislators and governors who are taking these actions do it because they believe in a a free and open internet. So Rick and John, the companies that your associations represent have already jumped up and said, we're not going to do any of these bad things. Um, that's bad in quotation marks. Why then do we need these state rulings or why don't we? So Rick, do you want to go first? Absolutely. So uh, we don't need them. Um, and I thought you were going to ask, why do we have them? And I think it's basically politics and misinformation. Let me just say on the misinformation piece, uh, I mean, you know, uh, Ellen mentioned a lot of people in a lot of people's minds, FTC is not adequate. That may or may not be, but the average person has no idea that the FTC will have anything to do here. Um, I came home the day of uh, the, uh, the vote at the FCC. And my 10-year-old daughter said to me, Daddy, why are we going to have to pay $20 every time we do a Google search? I'm like, what are you talking about? There is so much misinformation. And, you know, we're sadly, we're beyond the point of correcting a lot of that disinformation. So, yes, it's a populist issue. Yes, the companies themselves believe in net neutrality, and we can talk about those um, specifics. But, uh, but I want to give a little of the political context. If Catherine could go back to slide seven, please, of her slides. Um, and I just want to talk about um, the, and yes, yeah, so there we go. Uh, one more. Uh, make it slide six. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is not a criticism of Catherine or any researcher or NRI, um, because I deal with this with my own executives. So. Um, a slide like this, and, and there you know, are other slides not in this presentation that might even have uh, more states lit up, is very misleading. It, um, you know, we said at the beginning 36 states have considered some action, and when I'm trying to get a bigger budget for my state team, that's very handy for me to say. But when I'm trying to calm the waters, then what I have to do is explain, well, let's see. There are 26 states that are red trifecta states. They are Republican governor and both chambers Republican. So we can probably take those off the table right away for any action. So that leaves 24 states. All told, there's 33 Republican governors only one of them, Rhode Island, so far has issued an executive order. You can look at, the, there's lots of ways to slice and dice. You can look at the blue trifecta states, et cetera, et cetera. The realistic, uh, in my mind, um, universe of states that were ever going to do something uh, beyond a resolution, which has no real force, but even if we take a resolution, is about 12 states. And this is apart from the attorney generals all suing, all of which are Democrats. So party affiliation is important here to consider also. So I think a chart like this, and again, not by design uh, and not ascribing any motives, uh, is incredibly misleading when we see 36 states have done so-and-so. Well, realistically, it's, you know, 12 states, and so far it's, uh, you know, eight states, uh, because, you know, discounting the resolution, uh, six states that have executive orders and three uh, that have, um, uh, past legislation, and you know, one of which has done both, uh, so eight states. And of the 12 that are pending, realistically, again, you know, you have California highly likely to do something, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, maybe, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, highly unlikely. Uh, you know, Delaware is only looking at a resolution, so even looking at what's pending it's very overstated in the minds of when I have to explain to my bosses that are concerned about what's happening out there, you know, it's sort of get a grip, 
let's see what is really actually happening. And let's go up to this list of cities, if we could, Catherine. So I know that, you know, the mayors that uh, signed this letter, you know, it's an impressive looking group of um, 123 cities. But, you know, I did a little research and according to the U.S. Geological Survey, there's 35,000 cities in the country. Uh, the U.S. Mayor's Conference of Mayors says there's about 19,429 municipal governments. If you look at population 10,000 or above, there's about 4,000. There's 151 cities that have an international airport. Of the cities, the 123 listed here, uh, 17 I was able to rapidly identify as the 100 largest. I'll grant that I did a quick view, so let's call it 20 out of these might be in the 100 largest cities. So, you know, I am not impressed that these 123 cities have signed a letter uh, as a as a cri de coeur. Uh, my French is not very good. Uh, you know, a cry from the heart about net neutrality. So you know, I just wanted to contextualize what's really happening out there on net neutrality in the states. And then we can talk about, I mean, I'll defer to John now, but then we can talk about you know, likely preemption and all of those things. But I just really want people to understand that when they say the states are doing all of these things, it's really not that many states are really doing something. So, Sherry, can I just make a comment on that? I, I was going to, to um, suggest that you or Tim might want to weigh in at this point, and then we'll go forward. So go right ahead. Yeah, thank you. And, and Tim, I don't want to step on you if you want to also say something, but um, I, I, I guess I respectfully disagree with you, Rick. I don't think that this is just a Democrat versus Republican issue. I think I suspect that your clients and the ISPs do business in every state. And the fact that whether it's half or a third of them are concerned enough about this repeal to have taken up bills months before it even went into effect should be an alarm bell for the industry that this is a real issue. This is not just, I would respectfully say, a political stunt. I think this is a real indication of dissatisfaction with what has happened at the FCC. So I think it's um, sort of, it's misleading to just dismiss it as, as, as politics. I think this is an indication of um, action by or consideration of strong action and a strong rebuke of this effort by over a third of the states and a half of them. If you, you know, just look at the number who are considering, who considered bills strongly, including Connecticut, in which it passed the Senate. So I'll, I'll grant you Connecticut, but I will say that, you know, in a state like uh, Kansas, where one lone Democrat legislator introduced a bill that was never going anywhere, uh, you know, that that's hardly consideration. But yes, there's something real behind it. But if we liken this to the ISP privacy movement of last year, um, you know, much of that was just part of the Trump resistance. And I'm not saying that's what this is, but, you know, a lot of it had little to do with the actual, you know, what is, uh, uh, you know, internet service provider privacy policy all about. But people were explicit that they were doing this as a rejection of the Trump administration and blaming President Trump for, uh, you know, rolling back the FCC's privacy protections, et cetera, et cetera. And, so, you know, in a, I, I, I agree it's not just a Republican Democrat issue. But having said that, you know, I think it was clear that uh, there was a, a limited set of places where something might move beyond just a, uh, oh, you know, introduction and consideration. You, you are, okay. before we turn this into a purely red versus blue discussion, not, Tim, is there some reason that you see that are make that, that other than the consideration of Montana's governor wanting to run again, um, it, what do you see as influencing the states and the cities to be so concerned about this? Well, um, I, you know, it's a, it's a common refrain from the phone and cable industry lobbyists that 
the public doesn't really know what's good for it. Therefore, we should leave these internet policy decisions to, you guessed it, the phone and cable industry lobbyists. Um, the reality is, and through public polling, we found very, very strong support from both Republicans and Democrats. You can look at a University of Maryland poll where they explain the issues very clearly to people. And uh, a 86%, uh, including 83% <laughs> of Republicans, said that they support the net neutrality title rules that we have in place. So I wanna push back considerably against this idea that the public desire for net neutrality should be considered something of lesser importance. We are still a democracy here, folks. And one of the reasons why people at the state level and at the city level, and I, I've done the organizing of the cities. There are more than, there are, we're now at 126 cities representing 27 million people um, where they have taken these pledges. It's a no small number. Um, and we, um, and they're doing it because they feel that Washington, particular this FCC, has failed to do the right thing. It has failed to take into consideration not only the law, the Title II rules that we had uh, were won a successful court challenge in 2016, but they also ignored the will of the people who by millions and millions but uh, added comments to the FCC docket. We've also had millions more who are calling members of Congress. So let's, let's keep our bearings here when we're talking about what it is we're trying to accomplish. In my thinking, we're trying to accomplish for the internet what the people want. And that's why you are seeing such a strong reaction on the local level, in the states, um, in the cities, and that will continue to be so. Now, I should add one thing though. I think that it's, I think that, that we're right in being concerned about a piecemeal, piecemeal solution to net neutrality. Um, mm. it's, it's hard for cities and states to cover um, the, the country. We do really do need a federal solution. We did have one in 2015. Hopefully we will have one when the CRA is passed in Congress, which will restore those, those rules at a federal level. So, um, so yes, I think there are reasonable reasons to be concerned about states and cities because there will be states, always be states and cities that won't be able to offer these protections. Um, but it's not, uh, it's, not to, it's not right to be dismissive of what's happening on a local level because, oh. because there's some notion that, po that, that populism, that what the people want is somehow a bad thing. So I also want to, to kind of move us along Sherry. so we can get into a couple of the technical issues. And I think, John, was that you? Yep, um, but you can ask a new question, that'd be fine. Well, what I, I want to go to you and ask a question that we've seen from the audience as well as I think in a lot of the discussion um, around this item, the RIF order says that the states are preempted from making these laws or from trying to undo what the FCC has done. What do you see as what will happen with legal challenges? Do you think we'll see some? Um, do you have one on your desk yet? <laughs> I think there will be legal challenges, to the state laws that actually get enacted and the same with the executive orders. And I think those will be preempted because what the FCC did is got rid of some of this old school Title II stuff, but there is a framework in place to protect net neutrality. And under the FCC rules, there are first just the basic promises that companies make their customers, which do matter, but they're not just promises because the FCC's rules require companies to describe all this stuff and once the companies do that, those are enforceable by the FTC or by state's attorneys generals under their uh, baby FTC acts and the antitrust laws apply. So what, just as ISPs, what we're getting closer to is the way everyone else in the internet ecosystem is regulated. We're getting closer to the way Google and 
and Netflix and everyone else is regulated. We're not all the way there yet, but you know, we have a stronger framework, but it's still the sort of framework that governs the rest of the ecosystem. And I think, you know, people expect some basic parity or level playing field among this group of customers and a group of providers. And, you know, if we want more, then I think we need to get more at the federal level. It's just in, inconceivable that state laws can apply to the flow of internet traffic because no internet traffic network is designed with state boundaries in mind. Can I just jump in with one quick point there, Sherry? Um, you know, uh, Chairman Wheeler in the in the 2015 order also said, uh, first of all, declared it interstate um, uh, bias service interstate, and said that he would preempt states that you know went further than the FCC or were inconsistent, whatever the language was. And even um, Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, uh, you know, certainly a proponent of net neutrality. I'm looking at a blog post from, uh, I'm not sure if it was Ernesto Falcon or not, but um, uh, here's the title. California Senate misfires on network neutrality, ignores viable option, and basically says that this was with reference to SB 460, um, that it would likely be preempted because the FCC has, you know, declared state laws would be preempted under, you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever. And, uh, you know, they agree. So I just wanted to make the point that it's not as if the RIF order suddenly said preemption, preemption, uh, you know, many reasonable minds on both sides of all ideolog ideal ideologies here um, believe that the FCC can preempt. And that is why, in fact, Washington State so far is the only state that has passed legislation that has uh, tried to replicate the FCC order. The other two states that passed legislation, Oregon and Vermont, were in the nature of procurement, and all the executive orders are in the nature of procurement. And we can talk about, you know, whether that would be preempted and to what extent. And, you know, John knows better than I about the market participant doctrine, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is, um, you know, I think states understand that just trying to replicate what the FCC did, they'll be preempted, so they're not even bothering. So, Commissioner Kavula, one of your concerns about state action has been whether the states actually have the wherewithal to look at the activities of the people you've contracted with and to actually manage it or if there is a problem, deal with it. Is, is that something that the states, it, are the states just not capable of it or is this because there are so many different agencies looking at this on a state-by-state -state basis? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, usually when you implement um, a, a new, you know, I, again, the the procurement has essentially been a backdoor way to implement a new form of public utility regulation that concerns itself with uh, the net neutral conduct of ISPs that do business with the state, but which is applicable not just to the state as a procurer, but to all citizens of Montana. Usually that implementation would be attended by some administrative rulemaking that describes the, you know, if it's complaint-based regulation, describes how people make a complaint, how, how such complaints are heard. Uh, it would include some provision for the, uh, you know, surveilling these ISPs and randomly auditing or checking uh, compliance with net neutrality. None of that regulatory superstructure that exists with respect to, say, the uh, PSC in Montana's regulation of electric utilities um, was was implemented as part of this. And so the question is, does this become kind of a, a dead letter uh, because there's really no one there to actually enforce it? Or if it is going to be uh, actively proactively enforced through a regime of auditing and compliance, how, how does that happen? And who are these people in terms of state staffers who would go about doing that? And, uh, you know, I can just say for the moment that there, there 
is no appropriation for that. These people are not in place. And, uh, you know, my own view of Montana state government is that, you know, it's lean in some areas, it has more resources than others, but there's definitely no office that's capable of riding herd on, on this particular question. So, Ellen, do you want to weigh in on that? You're close to a number of, of states. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a couple different issues floating around here, and I want to go back to where you said that um, a number of our big ISPs, Internet Service Providers, had said that they have no plans to engage in violations of net neutrality, and they have no plans to have paid prioritization, um, although certainly AT&T has said something about the value of paid prioritization in certain circumstances. Charter has not said they will not engage in paid prioritization. So we're already seeing sort of this eroding of, well, just give us a little bit, you know. Um, so I think there's a reason for people to be concerned. Uh, and then the question is, can states handle this? Um, Listen, states regulate all kinds of complex things. Uh, if, if I'm, I'm the advocate for electricity, which is an incredibly complex and dynamic system that's ever evolving, as well as telecommunications and other areas, natural gas. So if the state really wants to do it, I think they have the ability to develop the expertise to do it. So clearly, uh, probably most of them don't have it now because this hasn't been an area they've regulated. Um, but it, and, and is it, less than ideal to have each state have a different regulatory system. I mean, I understand the commissioner's concern, but it's just so ironic that the industry, which lobbied so hard for repeal of the net neutrality regulations, not just under Title II, but in the other iterations that you laid out so well in your uh, presentation, sort of the history. This didn't conversation just didn't blossom in 2015. It's, there's a long history of the FCC up until this time trying to establish and protect the open internet and put rules fences around that. Um, but the industry which lobbied so hard against a federal scheme is now, I think, misjudged how much of a public bash backlash there was going to be. And I think this is real concern. I don't think, and I don't think it's trendy that people want a fair and an open and an equitable internet. I think that's something people expect. And therefore, um, the fact that now we see states going, well, if the feds aren't going to act, we have to do something, even if it's just to send a message that this is unacceptable. And now the industry is saying, well, well we don't want a whole different bunch of state rules. So, you know, no, maybe we need to go back and look at the federal rules. You know, I think this was misplayed by the industry, frankly. And I think um, this is what you expect when you take on an issue that is of great concern to Americans and the federal government takes such a significant step back. So, um, you know, if the states have to regulate it, I am confident uh, the ones that choose to do it will eventually develop the expertise. So, Sherry, I just have to jump in a little bit and say, look, you know, we are all for a federal solution. We have called for legislation enshrining uh, rules um, but where the debate largely has centered is who is the appropriate agency, whether it's the FCC or the FTC. And, you know, I know that Ellen didn't say this, but others have that the FCC has, you know, abandoned all responsibility, but that's not actually accurate. They are requiring folks to, um, to uh, report and post on uh, through the transparency rule on their practices, and then those are enforceable commitments by the FTC. And we can talk about is the FTC, you know, the right one or, or et cetera, but, uh, you know, but, but we uh, were not and are not seeking an abandonment of all federal uh, oversight here. So I think that's a mischaracterization. But also, you know, to your question, I think it's largely beside the point whether the states have the expertise, because at the end of the day, as John said, you know, there is no question that this is an interstate service. And I'm highly confident that at the end of the day, states are not going to be in a position of regulating uh, net neutrality. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not too concerned about which agency a state law that is likely to be overturned might recommend ought to be doing it. So let me walk this back for just a moment and ask a couple of other questions. Um, 
about the FTC, interestingly today, I, I had a robocall from those folks that say, if you don't send us money really fast, the IRS is going to come and put you in handcuffs and take you away. So I reported that to the FTC, but do they actually have the ability to manage such highly technical things as net neutrality? Don't the questions that Commissioner Kabula has asked about the state capabilities, don't they apply to the FTC as well? And Tim, let me start with you on that one. Sure. Um, the good news is that we had a legally defensible federal net neutrality standard uh, under FCC authority in 2015. Again, that withstood a legal challenge. And in the two years under that authority, investment from in capital expenditures from the broadband industry increased as did innovation and this is not just me talking this is this is this is compiling data provided by these companies themselves to the fcc it's from data that was provided through by the u.s census bureau's capital expenditure so, so we had federal net neutrality rules we had a healthy sector with investment and profits and we had an internet using public that had a safeguard that would protect them from net neutrality violations um, in a very meaningful way. We don't have that now. With the FTC and, and the structure proposed, if you could call it that, by Chairman Pai of the FCC, basically abdicates enforcement authority in the name of a transparency standard, which is a little more than a slap on the wrist should an internet service provider decide to violate net neutrality standards as we've come to know them and as they were defined under the law. The, um, um, the, which, and it's, so we are at a moment where we do need to redefine the authority and there is a history of violation by ISPs of net neutrality standards that does need to be addressed. Um, it is a problem in need of a solution. Um, and wow. at the moment, we do have a procedure in Congress that would restore the open internet rules that we established in 2015. Surprisingly, um, to some in Washington, it actually passed the Senate. I mean, it is now in uh, the House, um, and uh, there is a lot of active organizing to get, to get it through the House as well. So. Yes, I agree that a federal solution in the end is probably the best path here. I'm, that's not to say that I'm not encouraged by all of the things that are going on at a local level. I think uh, local uh, state houses and governors and, and, uh, and, and city halls have the right to do something about protecting the open internet rights of their citizens. But I do think that, that we need to find the proper federal authority. Uh, and in my view, it's, it is the FCC, the Federal Communications commission that should regulate the future of communications. So let me move on to another more technical, I guess, point. Um, commission, Chairman Pai has said that as, as recently as a YouTube video he did today, that the Restoring Internet Freedom Order will bring us a better, faster, and cheaper internet. So, John, how's that going to happen? You represent a lot of the companies that, that provide this service. So, let me give you a quick answer on that and on the FTC. So, what people want, as everyone here has said, is an open internet. And what people also want is an internet that keeps getting better and faster. They want more fiber, they want faster speeds. And the question that we all have to deal with is whether more rules on ISPs that might make somebody feel better about the open internet but don't really do anything, are, are those going to harm you know, the investment that ISPs have to make? I was telling you earlier, if 
you know, on the order of $75 billion. We're like the investment leaders of the U.S. And so when we had the Title II rules, investment did go down according to our statistics. And that's all on our website. And really, if you want to think about what Title II means, I think the best thing to do is look at Europe, because Europe is fundamentally a Title II place. And investment by ISPs in Europe is about half what it is here. So if you, what you want is gigabit speeds and 5G, and you want to stream 4K video, some of these ill-conceived rules are going to harm that, and that's going to hurt customers and consumers a lot. I think that the current setup does give us some open internet protections, and what Chairman Pai has done is put the FTC in charge of that. Having worked at the FTC a long time, I think what they would tell you is this is not really as much a technical matter as it is one about what is what kind of practices are deceptive or unfair to consumers. And that's what the one FTC of you is in big trouble. Is. The FTC is they are experts at what is what hurts consumers, what's deceptive, what's unfair. That's the expertise they bring to this. And I think that's you know what consumers want, protection from that. So there is a framework in place, and we don't want to end up with investment like Europe, where people don't have 5G or they're not about to get it, they don't have cable and telco competition, they just have one network. So, I mean, that's really the nuanced argument, is how do you get consumers both the things they want, a better internet and, um, you know, the no blocking, no throttling that, as Rick has said, is built into the way we offer service. Sherry, could I respond to that? You may indeed. Sure. Well, first of all, I don't think it's really appropriate to compare us to Europe when you, I mean, Europe has a and tremendous amount of public investment, so we don't really have that here in the U.S., so it's not really a fair comparison. Um, but with respect to the FTC, I think your example with respect to the robocall is a good one because there are, you know, limits on robocalls, and they probably aren't supposed to be calling your phone. And I would also bet that you are part of your phone is on the no-call list for uh, for any kind of advertising, and nonetheless, we see continual violations and great difficulty reining in even that those kinds of services. And as was made, the point was made earlier, um, the FTC has to react to a violation of something. And yes, there are transparency rules applied by the FCC with respect to ISPs, but you know, from the consumer experience, the ability to read and understand those contracts, those rules, uh, it's incredibly complex. And the fact that uh, an ISP may decide to start, I suspect we'll see a drip, drip, drip of changes uh, with respect to what I would view as infringements on net neutrality principles, just a tiny bit at a time, a little bit at a time, such that consumers, A, they're not going to be able to understand the contracts, I don't think they can now, and they're not going to be able to follow, most of us, I couldn't follow the fact that there would be a change in a few sentences um, every couple months to the contract such that I would even know that they had violated the terms of my contract. So I think to say that transparency around these contracts is the solution is um, completely inconsistent with the consumer experience. So I, I just want to point out that we've gone full circle from, you know, consumers totally get it, and that's why we need net neutrality to consumers don't really understand, and, man, that's a shame. That's not what I said I at all. That is not what I said at all. Uh, I said well, the contracts you know, are incredibly complex and difficult okay, to understand. And, and, right, and, and consumers have problems there, but before, I think it was actually Tim that mentioned in the context of, you know, the state legislation that uh, – you know, yes, we're doing it because consumers get it. They understand what net neutrality is. When I think when you talk to the average person, uh, you know, they really don't. But, but that's beside the point. I just want to respond on one thing that um, Tim said, which was the free press study about investment, which I think has been uh, debunked in various places. But um, one, and, and John mentioned, you know, the U.S. telecom investment statistics. But one thing I'm looking at right now is, um, the Center for Public Integrity had a, and you know, that's, they're no friend of, uh, you know, of industry, 
they had a news analysis the other day, and and I thought this was great. Not their sort of uh, you know the, the the final point that they make, but it had to do with deployment, and they acknowledged that deployment slowed uh, during the time of the Wheeler order, but they ascribe a different rationale. They say that we were running out of customers. There weren't enough people to buy the service, and that's why deployment slowed. But what I took from it was they are acknowledging what most people have understood, which was there was an actual, uh, if you don't want to say it's an impact, there was at least a real-world noticeable thing, which was a slowing deployment during that period. Rick, I believe you're mischaracterizing that study, which has found that, in fact, that, which found that there is no way with so many variables to tie one regulation to behavior in capital expenditure. Our study correctly cited SEC. We've quoted the the CIOs and CEOs of the companies that you represent in saying that net neutrality rules will in no way have an impact on their plans to continue invest in the sector. The reality of that is that, that, that you cannot, as you have attempted to do, and as Chairman Pai has attempted to do, to say this regulation had a direct result on this level of investment in the sector. And we know where said. Well, I think if you look at the actual that numbers that and not just the statements of, uh, you know, the actual numbers of investment, and my recollection is the free press study included investment in Mexico and a few other places. George Ford had an excellent critique, as I recall. But I'm just going to read one line from the article about the Center for Public Integrity. Most pointedly, while wireline deployment did slow while net network neutrality rules were in place, it was due to a, what, at least one reason that had nothing to do with regulation. So that's fine. I'll, I'll accept that they're saying it wasn't because of net neutrality, but they are acknowledging that it did actually slow. So maybe the larger point is, you know, who knows, but you can't simply say, hey, my guy said I'm still going to invest. Uh, yes, they're still going to invest. They're just not going to invest as much. Okay, so... My, I've got my super soaker out, so you guys should move a little bit away from your speakers. Um, let's agree to disagree on investment, and let's go back to the point that I think Ellen was making about transparency, and, and Travis, I think you were making a similar point. I have read, actually Comcast has, has posted its uh, transparency information and I read through it and I should probably understand this stuff, right? I've been doing telecom for a long time. Is, is the place where the states can weigh in the best in helping customers to understand what these transparency offers are and in tracking how well they work? Is that one way to make sure that things keep working? Um, I, I would hope so. I mean, and, and the reality is, I mean, there's a lot of complicated product offerings um, throughout telecom uh, in those states that have electric and natural gas choice, they can be quite complicated. And there's usually some system whereby uh, the sort of technical details of an offering are intermediated somehow in a more consumer-friendly interface, whether it be a place where people can shop around or uh, through, a, through a consumer organization like AARP, uh, can uh, sort of offer a compare and contrast to products or even endorse products that they think uh, meet consumers' needs. I, I assume rather than expecting any consumer through the fine details of an offering, that's hopefully the world that we'll drive to. Um, but, you know, that, that in itself, the future remains unwritten there. 
the point I made in, in my slide deck is that there seems to be common ground between, say, the state of Montana's executive order and the FCC, at least as far as transparency goes. The, the state's executive order and its implementation through procurement says uh, that, these con that these offers are effectively safe harbored from the transparency mandate of the state executive order so long as they're complying with the FCC's transparency rules. So for whatever we may be disagreeing about in this call, uh, the Venn diagram there uh, is at least overlapping. And I would just so before we go on, let me remind all of our listeners that we will be happy to take your questions and just type them in the box. We have only about 10 minutes left. So, Ellen, go right ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, well, going back to your question to me, I think that what the states are doing is trying to ensure that consumers um, get the uh, net neutrality principles that they want. Listen, I think consumers do understand that you can explain it in two sentences. Do you want your access to the internet to be open, unfettered, and un, uh, unfiltered, uncensored? Yes. Do you think your internet service provider, the pipe to which you get to the internet, should have the ability to steer you, block you, slow you down? Absolutely not making sure that those principles are enshrined in a very complicated contract is very difficult for any consumer to discern as you i know you're a very experienced telecom person cherry and the fact that you had trouble doing it um, is a fair indication of that and so states are saying uh, we're going to make sure you're going to do that in our state but with respect to transparency there's another issue here which is that even if it is clearly transparent that your ISP is engaging in some form of um, internet blocking, throttling, paid prioritization that you find um, unsavory, most Americans don't have a whole lot of choice. They have one or at best two internet service providers from which to choose from. If we had tremendous choice, you know, I had a choice of five or six internet service providers, well, then it would be much easier to shop around. But I sort of got to take what they're giving me. And so, again, that's another reason why consumers are really powerless in this situation. And that's why they're turning to their state houses and also to the federal government. Okay. So we Sir, just. Uh, yeah, right ahead. You know, just in terms of, I think Commissioner Kamala is right about the state role. Under the current framework, you know, another role that states have is that their state attorneys general can enforce, you know, acts that prohibit unfair or deceptive practices by broadband ISPs, and that's explicitly contemplated in the order. Um, you know, and I think from the ISP pers perspective, that's that's what a, a thing consumers are looking for, right? Is no one's interested in being deceptive or unfair to consumers. You know, there, there are ways to enforce that both at the FTC and at the state. So let me, we have a, a very interesting, a um, couple of very interesting questions that came to us. Um, talking about protected speech. So is there any interest? either in the state or either on the state or the federal level in rules that will protect speech from entities that are providing internet service. It, is that what we may or may not continue to see um, with these reduced or changed rules. Um, I Rick, I assume your your folks are not going to, to look at the speech. They're going to look at how best to provide service. I'm going to let, let John, I mean, we, we don't look at the speech. I'm not even really quite sure how to um, answer the question. So I'm going to defer. 
I will say this is it's a great question, and it's one the entire internet is grappling with. You know, Facebook and everyone else that publishes news or purports to be a platform for information. ISVs have not been involved in that. We're not interested in being the fake news police or what's fair and balanced. And you know, traditionally we've never done that. And I don't think you know the ISVs want anything to do with getting sucked into that debate to the most we can stay out of it. It's not, it's not, you know, we don't censor comment, con content. We're not a content platform. Um, I should add that the, um, during the argument that was made in the debate around the 2015 rules that the ISPs had put forward this notion uh, that the First Amendment gave them the right to be the editors of the internet um, to ed edit the internet much in the same way a newspaper editor would decide which stories go on page one, uh, which stories go in the back of the book in the op-ed section. But really the free speech question I think is, is a very critical one because we are talking about a communications medium that goes over private networks. Obviously, people familiar with the First Amendment know that it, it applies to uh, restricting government entities. But uh, there is um, a place for common carriage as a rule. And one of the reasons that common carriage is an important standard for communications is that it does protect free speech over private networks um, by making sure that the ISPs don't behave as the gatekeepers to information that they may or may not deem appropriate. So I agree with Rick and, and Jonathan that it's a very complicated issue, but I do want to be clear that you know there is a place and a way to look at this issue when we're talking about protecting speech over private networks. So you know I I always worry when we do one of these webinars that we won't have enough discussion to fill up the 90 minutes. But it appears <laughs> that that is never the problem. So I want to thank our panelists and, and let each of you uh, have a minute to summarize your arguments or give us some new information that we should place that we should pay attention to as we move to day four of restoring internet freedom. So, uh, Travis, you were last last time, so this time you can be first. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to present, and uh, although Montana doesn't necessarily look for the spotlight, the spotlight's shining on it here. Um, I anticipate some litigation over this, but in the meantime, it will be interesting to see how a state trying to implement net neutrality through contractual provisions is, is or isn't actually able to do so. And I don't think we can reach uh, any conclusions for the moment on that. John Banks? I would say that there is a framework in place with the FTC and the states and DOJ and all to protect competition and consumers on the internet. But we have long recognized that a single piece of federal legislation would be the best solution and trying to cut through all this on the Hill and get that done has proved to be a real challenge. And I think to the extent states and everyone else could focus their efforts on getting some legislation through the Congress, that would be great for consumers and it would give ISPs the certainty they need to keep investing at these ginormous levels to keep the internet working. Rick? So uh, I'm going to quote from a letter to the editor or op-ed from the uh, head of the Alaska Telecom Association that appeared um, yesterday that I thought was perfect. Uh, and it starts out this way. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But uh, we would like to assure you and all Alaska. Okay, we'd like to assure you and all Alaskans that we are committed to the principles of net neutrality. We do not block websites, we do not censor content, we do not throttle, discriminate, or degrade network performance based on content. These core tenets of net neutrality define our networks and the internet access we offer Alaskans. And we could just say the nation on behalf of all ISPs because I thought that summed it up very nicely. Kim? Well, ISPs, ISPs do not block 
content, throttle, or discriminate online until they do. And there has been a long history of them doing that. And the reason that the FCC appropriately in 2015 put in place net neutrality rules, it's not only because of that history, but because they recognized that the public in overwhelming numbers were asking for protections, protections against the type of blocking and throttling that will undoubtedly happen given the, the regulatory state that we have right now. And Ellen, from a consumer point of view particularly, how would you sum it all up and where do we go from here? Yeah, I would say that consumers are understandably concerned about this. And while it's nice that the ISPs are making these pledges now, you just go back to your slide too to look at all the ways that they have uh, fought against these rules. But if they're you know, now uh, committed to them, then we should all be working together to support legislation. But you know, it's not that I think these big internet companies are, are, Im are immoral or evil. It's their economic, their rational economic um, actors. And there's a lot of money to be made around paid prioritization. So if it's uh, not the law of the land that they can't do it. I think it's inevitable that it will, um, we will see erosions in, in small ways and perhaps large ways. And that's why I think we need federal legislation or state regulation. And that's, I think, why consumers are uh, understandably alarmed about the current state of affairs. And we haven't had a chance to talk about paid prioritization be at which Perhaps we can make the subject of our, one of our next webinars. I want to thank our panelists for handling what could be a very explosive situation, explosive discussion very well. And, and we appreciate each of you taking the time to join us today. Um, our next webinar is the July webinar, and it will address micro grids, policies, and pathways for progress. And I believe that is July. Catherine is looking it up for us. That will be our July webinar, and we will uh, and we'll be inviting all of you to join us at that time. That will be a Tom Stanton webinar, and it is Wednesday, July 11th. So again, let me thank our listeners. Let me thank our pre our presenters. And all of you for what I think has been a really interesting 90 minutes. So thank you all. This is the end of the webinar.